Meet our speaker, Lord, and open our hearts to receive what you're speaking to us. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you for your many blessings. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I do want to let you know that next week will be first Tuesday. Uh, so what that means is we'll go out to eat for lunch after our Bible study. So you want to mark that on your calendar. And we're going to go to Gloria's. How many of you have already been to Gloria's? Ah, a couple of people. It's a El Salvadorian restaurant that is opened up over close to the Asian town on um, uh, the north part of I-10 and then the cross cross road of uh, 99 there. Uh, but it's called Gloria's Latin Cuisine, and they have a, a really nice patio area, great food. You can, um, I'll send you the website, and you can get on there and start looking at the, the menu before you go. But uh, good food, I think you guys will enjoy it, and the patio area is really nice. So we will plan next week, after our Bible study, to go to Gloria's, so you want to mark that on your calendars. Also keep in mind uh, that uh, we have our bake sale coming up. In, uh, for Palm Sunday, we have Easter coming up, and then uh, the last Tuesday in April will actually be our final Bible study in here. So April goes pretty quickly, but uh, it's been good, and uh, I'm so grateful that you guys have been able to come each week as we go through the Gospel of Mark. I do want to share just one little, one verse this morning, just a little thought. I was doing some devotions this morning and was reading from Psalm 77. And uh, the writer here having a tough time talking about just, just really having a hard time. He cried out to God with his voice in the day of his trouble. He sought the Lord. He's just having a tough time. And I even, I like the way he describes it. He can't even sleep. You hold my eyelids open. He can't sleep. He's so troubled. He can't speak. He's having a tough time. It's hard for him to pray. But then he began to meditate on what the Lord had done for him. And this is so key for us in our moments of trial, trouble, distress, trouble, whatever we're going through, to meditate on what the Lord has done for us. And he begins to meditate um, on the Lord and what he's done. And he kind of gets himself worked up. He, he, in verse 7, he says, Will the Lord cast off forever? No. Will he be favorable no more? No. <laughs> Has his mercy ceased forever? No. Has his promise failed forevermore? No. Has God forgotten to be gracious? No. Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? No. Every one of the questions that he asked there, you have to say no to because God is still favorable to us. He still has mercy. His promises don't fail. He's not forgotten to be gracious and he's not going to shut up his tender mercies to his people. And this just stirs up the writer here, and then he begins to meditate, and he says, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. And of course, in the Old Testament, when you see the word right hand, you immediately, your mind should jump to who's sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. So he begins to meditate and remember the wonders of old. He meditates on all his work and talks of your deeds. And he specifically goes into when God delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea. And he gives a great description of, of kind of what the heavens were like, the clouds were like, the skies when that happened. But then he says this verse... In verse uh, 19, he says, your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters. Obviously, God wanted the children of Israel to go through that sea, to go through those great waters. That was his path. That was God's path. And then he says this right here. He says, and your footsteps were not known. Who didn't know it? The children of Israel, they were still learning all the ways of God. This was truly the beginning of their spiritual journey, understanding God in a whole new way, being able to grasp and just, uh, uh, just hold on to the promises of God, who he was. They were, this was a whole new journey and experience for them. So that his footsteps weren't known. 
But isn't it interesting, because this was God's way, this was God's path, you can still take assurance that God's footsteps were there even though the children of Israel didn't know it, didn't appreciate it, didn't understand it, didn't grasp it because it was his way. It was his path. He was leading it. And he goes on to say, you led your people like a flock, just like the sheep. You led them. You were there even though your footsteps weren't known. We didn't understand it. We didn't know it. And how many times have we been in a situation we didn't understand, we didn't know, God didn't seem to be there, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't feel him, we didn't see him, we didn't sense his presence, but yet we knew he was leading us. His footsteps were there. And I just want to encourage you this morning for somebody today that even though you're not seeing the footsteps, even though you may not be sensing his presence because this is his way, this is his path, you can rest assured his footsteps are there. He is leading you. He is guiding you. And just take assurance in that. And he finishes up here. He says, you led them by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And we can certainly take that Moses, who was the great lawgiver, represents the word of God. Aaron, who was over the worship of the temple, has to do with our praise, our prayers. So through the word of God and through our prayers, you're going to get through that Red Sea. You're going to get through that, and eventually the Holy Spirit's going to help you where you can see those footsteps, and you're going to look back, and you're going to know his footsteps were there with me because it was his path. It was his way. Amen? If you get a chance this week, look over Psalm 77. See what the Holy Spirit will speak to you through through those words. Great stuff. Great stuff, and I just love how so many times the writers of the Psalms, they, oh my goodness, life is hard, it's tough, it's dark, it's gloomy, and then by the time they get to the middle of the chapter, and certainly at the end, they've got their praise on, worshiping the Lord, and that's why we read these, so we can follow in those footsteps and be encouraged just just the same. Praise the Lord. Well, we do have a guest speaker today, and it's not me, but I just wanted to share that with you. Autumn Starnes is one of our missionaries that you support here at FLAG. She has been over in Thailand for about 11 years now. 14. Ooh, I missed a few. 14. She is a single missionary. Mm-hmm. She is. She has a roommate over there, a nice young lady whose name is Rebecca. And um, she has been in Thailand working with students there. She's going to tell you all about it. And we are so glad that she's with us. But she also has her mom, Marilyn Starnes. She works at the district office, so many of you may know who Marilyn is. And then she has her sister-in-law, Casey, who took the day off to come today and be with us. And so we're so glad that she's here. So give her a flag. Welcome. Autumn, come. Good morning. It's good to be here. Having my mom here and having Casey take off work to come here is no pressure. (laughs) Now, I think, when's the last time I was with you guys? About, well, I was here last month, but for your women's about seven years ago? Oh, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while, so I am due. Not in the new building. Yeah, not in the new building, so, yeah. Um. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself first, in case you don't remember, from seven years ago. Uh, I grew up in church my whole life in Baytown. I'm from Baytown. I'm from the east side of Houston, not this really nice west side. <laughs> but uh, I'm, from, I'm from Baytown. And my parents raised my brothers and I in church, and we were there every Sunday, every Wednesday. You know, we went to Sunday school, and I'm very thankful for Sunday school because that's really where I got my foundation in the Lord, all those stories that were taught. You know, they mean so much more to me now. They Back then, they were just stories, but now I'm in awe of them. But, uh, you know, missionaries would come to my church all the time. We had these week-long missions conventions where it was every night from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and it ended the next Sunday, and I loved it. I loved it. Probably not at the time, coming to church on a weeknight, but I really did enjoy it. But um, 
I never thought in a million years that the Lord would call me to be a missionary because missionaries are heroes, right? And I am not a hero. And the people in Thailand can tell you that I am not a hero. <laughs> but um, yeah, the Lord called me to missions. He, he called me to the other side of the world. And when I'm in Thailand, it feels very much like the other side of the world because they drive on the other side of the road right? The steering wheel's on the other side of the car, which caused a few dings when I was learning how to drive. And when I come home after being in Thailand for a long time, my mom won't let me drive for the first few weeks because it scares her. Um, And it scares me too, to be honest, because I have to get it right. You know, so that it's totally different than America. It just feels like the other side of the world. As a matter of fact, if I had a globe of the world and I put a finger on America and a finger on Thailand, it's the opposite side of the world. Like when it is midnight here, it is lunchtime there. You know, when it's time for breakfast here, they're eating dinner there. They've already had their day. So I uh, during an election year once, I was in Thailand and I was texting with one of my aunts, Aunt Sheila. And, you know, they were still counting the election, but because I was 12 hours ahead, I said, Aunt Sheila, I already know who won. And she was like, really? And I was like, no. (laughs) 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 Because I was 12 hours ahead. But, you know, Thai people think differently than we do. And their logic to us, to us, their logic is illogical. And the way we think to them is very straightforward. I mean, it's just it's hard to find ways to communicate with Thai people. <clears throat> but the more time that I spent with Thai people, like the more time I got to know them, the more I saw that we had a lot in common, right? Like when something's funny, they laugh. You know, when there's a baby in the room, we all gravitate towards the baby and we want to hold the baby and we want to make the baby laugh. Here we kiss the baby, but there they smell the baby, which is kind of kind of weird, but that's what they do. And even when I got a puppy, you know, they all wanted to come over and see my puppy, but they wouldn't like give it kisses on the head. They would, they would smell it, which is weird, but that's what they do. And just like us, you know, they need a savior. You know, they need to hear about Jesus. Thailand is, I think it's 0.7% Christian. And I don't know if you remember, but I was here last month with you guys And that means that every single time I leave my house, there is a 99% chance that I'm going to meet someone who has never heard about Jesus. And I'm not talking about people that have heard about Jesus and decided, no, that's really not for me. I mean people that have never heard the name of Jesus and how much he loves them. And as a matter of fact, for over 200 years, uh, missions, organizations from all over the world, not just the Assemblies of God, but all over the world have been sending missionaries into Thailand and still to this day, 0.7% are Christian. So there is still so much to be done in Thailand. Thailand is about 95% Buddhist. It's one of the most heavily Buddhist populations in the world for that, for that size of a country. Would you call that per capita? I'm not really sure. So Buddhism has such deep, deep roots in Thailand, and it is, it's like this dome, this dark dome of Buddhism just covers the nation, and it just takes so much prayer, so much prayer to break through that, that dome. So I'm actually here to recruit prayer people, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But what I do in Thailand is my colleague, Rebecca, also Rebecca, She, uh, we run a student center right outside of the main gate of one of the universities there in Thailand. And what we do is, well, first when we went, we wanted to do a coffee shop because I like coffee. And I was like, if I like coffee, everybody likes coffee, which isn't true. But when we moved there and we had lived there for a while, there were so many coffee shops in Chiang Rai, just so many little coffee shops. We thought we don't need, Chiang Rai does not need another coffee shop. So we decided to open a student center and focus on English because from the time Thai students start school, which is very, very young, all the way up until they graduate university, they're taught English, but they never get a chance to practice. So of all the surrounding countries in Asia or all the the countries that surround Thailand, 
Thailand has the lowest level of uh, English. Their proficiency level is the lowest. And so what we wanted to do was have a student center that gave them a chance to come and speak with an American, to practice their English with an American. And so what we do is we were open four, uh, four nights a week from about four o'clock in the afternoon until nine o'clock at night because they don't, they get out of school at four. They're done with university at four. They don't do night classes or anything like that in Thailand. So they come as soon as class is over, most of them, and they stay until nine or later. And they just practice their English. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to do that in a natural environment. Maybe not a classroom, but, you know, playing games together, cooking together, eating together, all of these different things. So um, that's what we do. So I actually have a few pictures because you guys have really played an important role in what I do in Thailand. I like to tell the story of William Carey. Have you ever heard of William Carey? He was a missionary in India, some of you. He was this missionary in India. And his friend told him one time, India is like this pit. You know, it's this pit that no one wants to go to. And William Carey said, I'll go down into the pit if you hold the rope. And sometimes I'm here to tell you that Thailand feels very much like a pit. It's so dark there. Now, Thai people are some of the nicest, most hospitable people you'll ever meet in your entire life. I mean, they smile all the time. It's actually called the land of smiles because everyone smiles. So when we all had to wear the masks, it was really sad because you couldn't see everyone's beautiful smile because they smile all the time, even when they're angry, they smile. They smile. They always know when I'm angry because I don't smile. <laughs> but they smile. And, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, what was I saying? The pit. the pit. Thank you. Yes, the pit. So what you guys have done is I feel like, you know, I have been lowered into the pit and you guys have held the rope for me. And what that rope does is it provides stability and support for missionaries. And I know that you are holding many ropes, not just my rope. And so I want to ask you, who is more important, the one who goes down into the pit or the one that holds the rope? Who's the most important? Both, right? You can't have one without the other. Someone cannot go into the pit unless someone holds the rope. And why hold a rope if no one's even going into the pit? So it takes all of us working together to accomplish this great commission that, that Jesus gave us to accomplish. It's our goal, you know. And so I know that people call missionaries heroes, but really I think y'all are more of the heroes too. You, are, you know, you're probably more of a hero than me because we all have to make sacrifices to make sure the whole world has the opportunity to hear about Jesus. So the pictures that I'm going to show you, I want you to feel just as much a part of it because you are a part of it. It's not just me. I'm not a one-woman show, you know. So if you can start. I'm not sure the order. Okay, so <laughs> I always feel like missionaries show pictures of their family. And because I'm single, this is my family. I do have a family. I have a mom and a dad. And I always feel bad when they're here and I'm showing these pictures and like, look at my family because I have a mom and a dad. I have two brothers and a sister-in-law and a nephew and a niece. So I do have a family. But I got these two dogs in Thailand and they have actually traveled with me to America. They were never supposed to come to America, but because of COVID, I didn't feel right about leaving them, not knowing for sure if I could ever get back to get them. So they are with me here in the States. They're getting very good at English. They know the word no <laughs> and treat. And I'm very thankful for my mom and for Casey because when I itinerate, if it's a short trip, my mom and dad will keep them. And if it's a longer trip, Casey and Anthony, Anthony will, my brother, will sacrifice and keep them for me. So I know they're in good hands. So if they didn't do that, I don't know if I could itinerate as much as I do because it is expensive to board animals in Thailand. So this is Lucy and Stella. So yeah, you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to show you this. This is where our student center is located. These are different little shops. So there's like, they're all separated and they're three stories tall. And this is back in 2015 when we first left Thailand, they had just built these. And so we knew that we could not get one of these buildings because we were fixing to leave. 
And, um, and so we prayed and we were like, Lord, just let there be at least one available because this is the perfect spot. There's parking. It's right outside of the gate. It's easy to explain to students where we're located. If you can just leave us one building. And when we got back, there was one building left. And so we took it. And they all look like this. Um, the entry was the gate. Like if you raise the gate, you walk right inside and it's this big open space. And so it wasn't really inviting or anything. But you can go to the next slide. And that, this is us in front of the building uh, with the gate half open. This is the day we got, we started renting. And so the owners were very gracious and they let us remodel however we wanted to. And the Lord just really gave us a lot of favor with them. So you can go to the next slide. This is what it looks like now, the outside. We put that glass storefront on it and we put that big awning and it's really easy to explain where we are now because we're like, we're the ones with the big roof. But students will park their motorbikes under there when it rains. We've pulled up sometimes and there's been a car parked up under there. I don't know what that's all about, but there people just use it. So yeah, it looks really sharp. It looks really sharp, and you guys played a big part in that because of your faithful giving, so thank you very much. We couldn't have done that without you guys, so you can go to the next slide. So before we opened, we invited our church to come. We go to, Rebecca and I go to a Thai church that speaks Thai, and we invited them to come, and we wanted to have a dedication, and we wanted to, de to dedicate this building to the Lord because Thailand is such a dark place that we wanted this building to be like a light, you know, in the midst of all this darkness going around. And so um, they did. They came in, and we sang some songs. They prayed. They prayed over everything. They prayed over the entryways. They prayed over the tables, the chairs, everything. They were just praying over it. And it, it, it's obvious because when students come in, like first-time students, when they walk in those doors and they sit down and we start talking to them, They'll say things like, it feels so different in here. It feels so warm. I, I don't know. It's, it's unlike, basically, it's unlike anything they've ever felt before because they're, you know, their Buddhist temples are so cold, you know, and they're so empty. And so for them to walk into a building where the Lord is and where the presence of, of the Holy Spirit is, it's completely different. They just don't know what it is, you know. So that's their first introduction into our building is that it's, it's so warm in here. So we're very thankful for the Thai church. So what we did was um, we started playing games with them. That's what we wanted to do because Thai society is a very low trust society. And so they are not going to trust me because I'm a foreigner, right? They're just not going to trust. They don't trust me. They're going to wonder, why, why are you being nice to me? What do you want from me? And so we just come in, and we're just like, hey, let's play Uno. And so they love Uno. We played Uno for probably the first three months every single night. And I would be like, do you want to play another game? Oh, no, we play Uno. Let's, then they'll say, let me teach you my way to play Uno. And their way is cheating. But... <laughs> I was trying, you know, I tried to smile and be like, it's cheating, it's cheating. And I was getting all angry, and Rebecca would say, Autumn, it's just a game, it's just a game. But so we would play Uno together, and um, one time, well, they'd been there coming at pretty regularly for three months, and we'd gotten to know a lot of them. And um, so we said, would you guys be interested in doing, like, a Bible study where we would do it in English, and we would just go through stories of the Bible, you know, like David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale, you know, all the stories that they had never heard, and then we would do it in English, and then we could talk about it in English. That way, you can practice listening and speaking, and they said, no, we don't want to do that <laughs> because it's the Bible, and that's your religion, but I'm a Buddhist, and I can't study the Bible. I can't read it because you were born a Christian, and I was born a Buddhist, but but we'll play Uno with you. And I said, oh, I hate Uno. No, I didn't say that. I said, okay, well, we'll just keep playing Uno. And so we did, which eventually, obviously, we got to different games too, praise the Lord. We taught them Jenga, Monopoly, which I don't like, but I suffered through it. Just all different games just to build relationships with them. And honestly, I loved it, and I had fun doing it. But at the end of the night, I always just felt like it wasn't enough. 
you know, like these games are not going to lead them to Jesus. You know, we, there's got to be more. So, but we just kept doing it. We just kept trying to stay in their world and trying to stay in their life. So, because it is such a low percentage of Christians, all of our students that come into our building are Buddhists. We haven't had one Christian. We may have had one Christian come in, but she was not a strong Christian. So, you can go to the next slide. We also cook together. When we remodeled our kitchen, we remodeled, uh, when we remodeled our building, we did our kitchen also because we, we love to cook. I mean, Rebecca really likes to cook and I like to eat her food, but we all like to cook together and the students would say, like once a week we started saying, let's do a meal together, let's just do a meal together. And so we would, and some weeks they would cook their food and teach us like how to make things like green curry and pad thai. Do y'all like Thai food, anybody? Yeah, yeah it's good stuff. And it's healthy, too, most of it. So they would teach us their food. And so I learned how to make spring rolls, and I learned how to make all kinds of different things. And then they would want us to teach us. They would want us to teach them how to make our food. And so we were like, well, what do you want, what do you want us to make? And they were like, oh, spaghetti, spaghetti. We love spaghetti. And I was like, Spaghetti? We need to work on those consonant clusters a little bit. <laughs> but I was like, they're like, oh, spaghetti. So we made spaghetti, and we made the garlic bread with the, with the garlic on top, you know, the good stuff. And um, they didn't like it. They did not like our spaghetti. They were like, mm, it needs more sugar. We need more sugar. And so they put so much sugar in it. I was like, y'all have just ruined spaghetti. Y'all have ruined it. And so then we were like, what else do you like? What else do you like? And they were like, pizza. We like pizza. So we made homemade pizza, like the dough and then and the toppings and everything. And so we were like, bring your favorite topping. And Rebecca and I went out and we found all the cheese and the pepperoni. And they brought things like squid and shrimp and crab sticks. And I was just like, oh, y'all, that's not pizza. That's gross. So... It was fun. It was a lot of fun to learn how they don't like our food. It was very humbling. But, no, it was fun. They were all good sports. We laugh. We, we had a lot of laughter and stuff. And I had actually I've heard a saying that says, love and laughter plows through hard hearts. And so we filled that Chi Alpha house. It's what we call it, Chi Alpha. We filled that Chi Alpha house with so much laughter and love. And we just loved them. You know, we just loved on them. So you can go to the next slide. And then we ate together. And this is, we have a long table and we all crowd around it. Um, so, yeah, we ate a lot of food together. I don't, we had chicken foot soup. Has anyone here ever had chicken feet? Have you had chicken feet? Really? I, see, I thought no one had had chicken feet, but I went to a church a few weeks ago and I had like four ladies come and say they've had chicken feet. And then I was like, am I the only American that has never had chicken feet? I wouldn't even know how to eat it. I wouldn't even know what to do. So they, we eat together, and then we talk, and we have conversations, because that's what you do when you eat. You know, you get to know people. And so I ended up having a lot of conversations with students, not so much over meals, because they don't like to talk in front of each other, because Thai people are very shy and very private. You know, they're very private people. But I would take Lucy and Stella to the, to the student center, and so... Every now and then, Re Rebecca and I would take turns walking them around this little area to, so they could go to the bathroom. And when a student wanted to talk to us, they would say, Ajahn, which is what they call like a teacher or a pastor. They would say, Ajahn, can I go with you to take them for a walk? And I was like, sure. And so every time we would walk, I would have conversations with students about their struggles with their family or their friends or school or struggles with suicide. So many conversations with students about their struggles with suicide. It's such a hopeless society. Um, Buddhism just leaves you feeling empty. And I had um, conversations with students about their struggle with homosexuality. And so really, even though I, they weren't interested in a Bible study, those were the moments that I got to share the Bible with them. You know, those were the moments that you know, we got to share Jesus with them. And so it was really interesting because, you know, 
the word of God is a wisdom not known to, it's like a supernatural wisdom that they've never heard before. And so we were saying things that they had never heard before. I mean, even, even like silly conversations that if we were playing cards with a group of girls, I might say, you know, hey, so-and-so, what, what do you look for in a husband? You know, what are some things that you look for in a husband? And they'd be like, oh, John, he's got to be handsome and tall and rich and a farang, which is a foreigner, and a foreigner. I want to marry a foreigner. And so, and then they would say, what do you look for in a husband? And I would say, um, for me, he has to love my family as much as I love my family. And they were like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, and he has to love God, my God more than I love my God. And then they were like, oh, okay, okay. So it's just different. We got to, anything we could do to like put Jesus in that conversation, that's what we did. So you can go to the next slide. We also teach conversational English classes, like actual classes. Every now and then we'll teach a module, which is four nights a week for one hour for three weeks which teaching English isn't one of our favorite things to do. I know some people love it, and I, I enjoy it when I do it, but it's not something that I'm, I wake up in the morning excited to do. But I do it because I want to connect with people that don't feel comfortable coming in and playing cards because Thai people are shy, and like I said, they don't trust a foreigner, but they'll trust me to teach them English. And so I felt really convicted one day because I was complaining because I was spending my whole day trying to figure out you know, how to teach a certain lesson because English is hard for me too. And I have to study the rules because they learn the rules. And I felt really convicted and I felt the Holy Spirit say, Autumn, I'm giving you 12 days to connect with these students. And after this class is over, after 12 days, they may never come back or they may come back. It depends on how hard you work to connect with them. And so now that's how I look at that's how I look at teaching English is I have 12 days to really connect with each of these students that come. And so that is what we do. And this is some of our freshmen over here. And this is a, on the, the right. And then on the left is a smaller class that we had. So, yeah. And apparently having freshmen is a really big deal because freshmen don't have time to do things like extra classes for English. So we were really excited to have these freshmen come. So you can go to the next slide. We also do things outside of, the, outside of the student center because we feel like it's important to go where they are. You know, I can't always invite them to come to where we are. And actually, the teachers at the school, the Lord has given us so much favor at the fac with, the, with the faculty all the way up to the president of the university. It's this favor that we don't deserve, and I don't know how we got it, but we got it. But whenever we have an English class, we send the information to the school, and they'll encourage their students to come to us, to like, you should go there because Autumn and Rebecca, they're just such great teachers. And I'm like, I'm not, but okay. But you should go there. They're very nice, and they care. That's what they say. They do recognize that, that we actually care about them, that we love their students, that we want them to be better, and we try to encourage them. But um, we also do things outside of the classroom, like up here on the far right, Rebecca and I went and had lunch with some students at the on campus, which I don't, Rebecca and I, we're not these huge extroverts, so for us to walk up to students and be like, can I have lunch with you? It's a little, you know, you know, but we do what we, we do what we got to do because our whole heart is to really connect with these students. So we can't always stay in our comfort zone, unfortunately. So we do different things. This picture up here, I won't go through all the pictures. But this picture up here on the far left is a really special picture because this is a girl. Um, her name is Aling, and we had known her since she was a freshman. At this point, she was a senior. And so one day, she came to our student center, and she said, Ajans, because they called us Ajans, because they were too lazy to say Ajan Autumn, Ajan Rebecca. Ajans, um, I would really like for you to come to my house and meet my family and have dinner with us, or have a lunch with us. And we said, okay, we'd never been invited to anyone's house before, so we said, okay. And so she gave us directions, and it was at the very top of a mountain. Like, Chiang Rai is full of mountains, and it was at the very top of this mountain. And so we got in our car, my speedlight vehicle, 
and we started going up this mountain, and we were like, oh, it's so pretty. She was already there. Uh, she was already at her house. She gave us directions, and me and Rebecca were like, oh, it's so pretty. It's so pretty, and then the, it started to get steeper and steeper and windier and, like, more narrow, and then we got so, we were so steep, I had to put the car in first gear, and I've never had to put an automatic car in first gear before, but we're just slowly crawling up this mountain, and then all of a sudden, this car in front of us starts rolling backwards, and I was like, oh my goodness, so I just whipped around them, because I've got mad skill on the mountains, but it was all the way to the top of this mountain, and we finally got to her village, and she said, you are the first foreigners to come to my house, to come and see my village. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is the first time Jesus has ever been invited into this village. Like, what an honor. And it's not because of some talent that Rebecca and I had, and it's not because of some special skill that we have. It's because every single day for four years, we loved Aling on purpose. You know, that's all we did is we just spent time with her. We cooked with her. We played so much Uno with her. And we just, you know, we enjoyed her and we loved her. And she knew it. And so she invited us up there and we got to meet her family. And her family has lived on this land for generations. And we were the first ones to ever get to go. And actually what they do is they grow tea. They're tea farmers. And so this machine on the far left is this. There was also another one on the right, but I cut it out. But on the far left, what they do is they put the tea leaves in there and they tumble dry it. And that's how they kind of shrink them down. So I have learned a lot about agriculture since living in Chiang Rai. But that was just very special. And that's how it is in Thailand. You know, there's places that have never had a Christian step foot. So it was just really neat to get to do that. And so before we left, we got to, you know, pray for her and pray for her family. And Thai people, they, they, they're not interested in Jesus, but they will let you pray a blessing over them. So when our students would have a test, they would always stick around. You know, they would come study, and then they would stick around until we prayed for them. And some, one time, Rebecca and I were in the kitchen while they were studying for their finals, and we were doing dishes or something. And we turned around, and they were all standing in the kitchen like this. And they said, John, we have to go because we have a test tomorrow morning. And we said, okay, bye. And they were like, but we have to go. And so we were like, oh, do you want us to pray for you? And they were like, yes. And so we would pray, you know, that God would help them to remember everything that they learned, that they've been studying, and that he would bring it back to their memory, and that they would do great on their tests. And they would stand there like this because they don't really know what to do during a prayer. And then when we were done, they would go. Because that's what they do. They, path, they put the blessing all over them, so that's what they would do. So it was really neat. You can go to the next slide. So I know this is a lot of pictures. I wanted to show you my house because I feel like a lot of people are always interested in where missionaries live. And because Rebecca and I are single and we're the only two missionaries in Chiang Rai, um, our leadership said you have to live in a neighborhood and it has to have a guard that, you know, will, you know, circle around. And they do. We have two guards that go around the block every 30 minutes. So this is my house. This is where I live. Okay. You can go to the next slide. It's a three-bedroom. It's not like a big mansion. It's just like a three-bedroom <laughs> house. So, um, you know, heart, the Heart Fund? You are familiar with the Heart Fund that, we, that you guys raise money for? Um, this is how I spend my money for the Heart Fund. So the Heart Fund helped me buy that table that we eat around and the couch that these students are sitting on. And, um, you know, I know people say that you know, the Heart Fund, we, we raise money to help buy um, housing essentials for, for the missionaries. But, you know, it's more than just buying a couch and it's more than just buying a table. You know, you guys have helped me buy a table where I can invite my Buddhist neighbors around because I live in a neighborhood with Buddhists and we've had Christmas parties and we've invited our neighbors and they came. And they come because they want to see what the inside of, Amer of an American's home looks like. And so at Christmas time, we deck it out like Hallmark. I mean, we have the tree. We have the garland coming down the stairs. We have the stockings. We have the lights. And they all come because they want to see. And so we eat together with our neighbors. And then we play games together, like silly Christmas games together. And then we get to tell them why we celebrate Christmas. 
you know, and so we just try to build relationships with our neighbors as well as students. But students like to come also. Like I said, we're open four days a week, so that fifth day, what do you think they do in the evening? They come to the couch and they sit down or they're on the floor, they're on these little mats that we have. Also, kids from our neighborhood come over, at, which was weird because I don't have kids. But we had Lucy and Stella, and they wanted to play with Lucy and Stella. So every morning, like at 8 or 8.30, there's the doorbell. And it's these kids, and they all want to come in and play. And so it got to where I would just let them in in my pajamas and shut the gate and go back in the house (laughs) and let them play. But one day, um, it was was like 8 o'clock in the morning, and the doorbell rang, and I was just not feeling it. You know, I did not want to play that day with kids. And Rebecca was busy with something, uh, probably school or something. And I said, I'm just going to go tell them that we can't, we can't play today. And she said, okay, that's fine. So I went down there, and it wasn't the kids. It was all their parents. They wanted to come over because they had, well, the kids had bought dogs during this time, and so they would bring their dogs over. And so I walk out there, and here's all these parents with their dogs, and they want to come in our yard. And I was like, man, I wish I wasn't in my pajamas today, but come on in. So we got to know all the kids' parents in the neighborhood. So, you know, it was really cool. So the Heart Fund is really a blessing. It really is. It does, it's it's so much more than just a couch or a TV or something, you know, the You help us furnish our homes so that we can have our neighbors over. So thank you for that. Go to the next one. And this is the last one for a few minutes. But this picture is really special, too, because all these students are Buddhists. Um, They're all Buddhists. And I was told it can take seven or eight years for a Buddhist to step foot into a church because they are not going to go into a church. Um, And so one year we had a team. And... We said, we really could use your help with translating the service for our team because it's just me and Rebecca, and there's like 12 team people, and we can't can't translate for everybody. Would any of you be interested in helping translate the service? And so they were like, "We we can go help do that. And so I said, great, we need some of you upstairs in the main service, and I need some of you downstairs with me in the kids' service. And so we we split them up, and... And um, we gave them special shirts so they would feel special. And um, part of them went upstairs with Rebecca, and the other ones came downstairs with me. And by the time church started, well, it hadn't even been probably maybe even 15 minutes into the upstairs service, they all got really, really scared. And so I ended up having all of these students downstairs with me in the kids' church because it's so different. You know, Christian church is so different than Buddhism. Because, you know, we worship the Lord, you know, and we're loud, and we worship the Lord. And Thai people are really loud when they worship the Lord, and they clap off beat, and it's crazy. But there's drums, and there's keyboards, and they didn't understand that. They didn't know what was going on. So it was a really, probably a very interesting experience for them. But it was really neat because, I mean, they, I've only known these guys for four years, and they went to church. And they didn't get saved and I, I didn't, I can't say that I really expected them to. I would have loved them to. Maybe I should have believed more and had more faith that they would. But they went to church, and that was such a big deal. You know, that was such a huge victory for us because maybe in the future they'll meet someone who will invite them to church again. And because they had already gone, they're, they're more apt to go again. You know, so I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful that they went. And, you know, the Lord has opened so many doors for us in Thailand that only he can open. And, um, well, let me tell you this story real fast. Let me see how much time I have. Okay, I got time. Um, Let me tell you this story. Before we had a student center, um, we would still do things. We would still try to connect with university students. And we had a team coming. I think it was in 2016. We had a team coming. And... We had arranged to do, we were going to be in their classroom. See, the the faculty lets us go into their classrooms during school and teach English. So they let our teams have a lot of access to their students. So God has really opened doors for us at the university. And um, we knew that it was rainy season because summer months are rainy season. I don't mean like sprinkles. I'm talking like typhoon rain but one good thing about Thailand is no tornadoes we don't have tornadoes in Thailand so the wind could be whipping the trees down and I'm sleeping like a baby because I know there is not going to be a tornado 
But we knew it was a rainy season. Anytime it rains, everything halts. And so we had a Saturday, we had two Saturdays, and we called them, um, it was like tourist day. And so each team, mem- each team member was assigned a university student, like a buddy, and that was their buddy for the day. And the university even gave us their huge bus, and this bus was going to take us anywhere we wanted to go. And so it was the, it was the Thai student's job to explain to the American student, because it was, it was university students that came, it was their job to explain, you know, like what they're looking at, where they're going, the history behind it, you know, to give that student a chance to practice their English. And it was the American's responsibility to take any opportunity they could to tell that student about Jesus. And so this was all day. That was their buddy. But we knew that if it rained, we would have to cancel it. And so Rebecca and I were prayer walking the campus one day, and I just prayed. I said, Lord, please hold back the rain Anytime we're outside with students, anytime we're outside with students, hold back the rain because we didn't have anywhere to go with them. We didn't have a student center and our house wasn't big enough. So I said, please hold back the rain, but do it in a way that they notice. You know, do it in a way that they take notice. And so Rebecca was like, yeah, yeah, do it in a way they take notice. (laughs) So we were on the bus and we were doing all these different stops. And every time we get on the bus, it poured like torrential rain. But as soon as we got to where we were going, it stopped. And so finally, one of the students came up to me and said, Ajahn, I think you are very lucky because every time we get off the bus, the rain stops. And I said, no, I'm not lucky. I know the God that controls the weather. That's the God that I pray to. So I got to share a little bit with him. But fast forward four years later, when we have a student center, let's see, I think she's up there. There is a girl in this picture. I won't point her out to you because I don't know if you'll ever find her. They all kind of look alike. But um, she actually lived with Rebecca and I for four months after she graduated college. She lived with us because she didn't have anywhere to go, but she had a job, but she didn't have any money for her place. She was supposed to stay like a weekend, but then she went home to visit her mom and came back with this huge duffel bag. And I was like, she is here to stay, Rebecca. I think we have a new roommate, but it was okay because she's Buddhist and it's good for her to live. I thought it was good for her to live with us, but she got a job at a hotel and every, well, when it started to rain, she did not want to go to work because it hurts to be on a motorbike in torrential rain. And no girl wants to show up with their hair all wet and nasty to work, right? So we would pray in front of her, Lord, you control the weather. You're the only God that controls the weather. Please, anytime Solom has to work, please hold back the rain. And he did. And she noticed. She was like, look at John. It's sunny. It's sunny. And it may not have happened like that, but before she left to work, it was always sunny. And so she took note of that. But it made me think, you know, had we not prayed that before, you know, just between the two of us, we may not have had the faith to pray it in front of her, you know. So uh, God really began to increase my faith when I lived in Thailand just by things like that. And it may seem silly because it's weather, but it was a really big deal because they have so many different gods and so many different goddesses to say there's one God and he controls everything, even the weather. And he loves you enough to where he will make it stop so you can get to work. So it was really neat to have her live with us because every day when she would come downstairs, she would find Rebecca and I doing what we do every morning, which is sitting on the couch, reading our Bibles, drinking our coffee. That's what we do every morning. So she really got to witness how we lived and how we talked to each other and how we honored each other. So it's very different from Buddhism. So... I, that was really neat to me. But we prayed when we left that Psalm would meet other people that could water the seeds that had been planted. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, you just never know, like, who's watching, right? You just never know. So, But I wanted to tell you, um, I can do it. I can do it. Um, there's one thing before we leave that I really want you to remember for the rest of your life. And I think it's so important. I want you to remember the unreached, right? Everybody say unreached. The unreached. I want you to know that there are people in the world today that will live their whole life and never meet a a Christian. That there are people that will live their whole life and never hear the gospel. I actually have a map 
that I want to show you. So the red part, I'm sure you've seen something like this because you guys are so missions-minded. Um, the red part is unreached people. Those are the people that have yet to hear about Jesus. The yellow part is where a formative church is. It's so there's a church formed there, but it may not be very strong. And the green part is where there's a, um, a good church established, like a strong church. So this map is actually made up of little dots of people groups. And when I was here, I heard pastor use the word people groups. And I was very impressed by that because a lot of people don't say people groups. But it's actually a bunch of little dots that make up these people groups. And the red part makes up 40% of the world's population. So, um, yeah. So these 40% may live their entire life and never get an opportunity to even wrestle with the gospel or wrestle, wrestle with the truth of it. And I'm not saying that, that these people in the red, that unreached, are more important than the lost, but there is a difference. And the best way I've heard it explained is in a story. I don't know, maybe you've heard it. But say there's two guys, and they're in the water, and they're struggling to stay afloat. Okay, The first guy is at the beach, and he's out in the beach, he's gone out too far, he doesn't have his swimmies or his floaties, but he's out there, and he's struggling, and he cannot keep his head above water. The second guy falls off the back of a cruise ship in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean, and no one hears it happen, or sees it happen. The difference is, well, first of all, both guys will equally drown, they're both equally important, and they'll both equally perish. The difference is the first guy at the beach, he sees the lifeguard and the lifeguard sees him. But maybe the guy who's out there, maybe he doesn't like lifeguards. You know, maybe he doesn't even think he's drowning. Maybe he thinks he's totally fine, you know. Maybe he's had a bad experience with lifeguards in the past and he's not interested in being checked out. Che he's not interested in checking out being rescued at the moment. But he has access to be rescued. You know, even though if he's not rescued, he will drown, but he can be rescued. He's got access to it. Whereas the guy who falls off the back of the cruise ship in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean, and no one sees it happen, is utterly lost unless someone is specifically sent to rescue him. Does that make sense? That is the difference between a lost person and unreached person. I think our unlost family, our, our unlost, our un, yeah, our lost family and our lost friends are just as important as the unreached, but there is a difference. Amen? How many of you knew that 40% lived in an unreached people group? I didn't either until I learned it. Then I was very surprised, and I, I think it's something that we should wrestle with. That's why I like to talk about it just a little bit, because I think this is something that we as believers should wrestle with. You know, as Americans, sometimes we think that people have what we have, but Americans only make up 5% of the whole population of the world. You know, so a lot of people don't have what we have, and um, that's why it's important to learn. But it's also important to learn because, to learn about the unreached, because if the only way to the Father is through the Son, right? If the only way to the kingdom is through the King, if there's only one way to get to heaven, then Buddhism isn't going to cut it, right? Buddhism's not going to get them there. Being a good person's not going to get them there. Hinduism's not going to get them there. If we don't get them the gospel, they won't hear the gospel. It sounds so simple, right? It, is, it sounds so logical. If we don't get it to them, they won't hear it. I mean, how do we get saved? Romans 10, 13 through 14 says... For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? So that's how we get saved. We call on the name of the Lord. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? So we have a clear path to salvation, right? And it runs through us. I mean, we don't provide salvation, but God uses us. And I've heard people say things like, 
You know, I, what about dreams? I hear that people in these countries have dreams all the time. Like they have dreams about Jesus and, and then they get saved. And that does happen, but for the most part, the reason so many are still unreached is not because Jesus has forgotten about them. It's because we have forgotten about them. Amen. <laughs> this is for me too. I live, I would say, I tell people I live smack in the middle of this red zone. Like I, that, I live there every day and I still have to be conscious and make an effort because I get so busy in my own life with things going on that I have to remember and I have to be intentional to pray for them and to, to do what I can to reach them. But people want to know if there are other ways to get to Jesus. But in Matthew, we find Jesus in the garden, right? And he's in agony and he's praying and he's asking the father. He's like, father, if there's any other way to do what you've called me to do, to finish the task that you've called me con to complete. Let's do that. Can we do that? You know, but what did he do? He went to the cross, right? He went to the cross. And it's that we see it in the lives of his disciples. You know, these people knew Jesus. They lived with him. They walked with him. They saw his prayer life. They saw the compassion that he had for people. I was just reading in my Bible this morning about how, you know, he was walking with his disciples and they came across a funeral procession and it was the, the funeral of the son, the only son of a widow. And when he saw that lady, he had so much compassion for her that he just went up and touched that coffin and came back to life. I mean, they saw things like that. They saw the compassion and the love that he had for them. And when he tells them to go, right, when he gives them that great commission, when he tells them to go and he ascends to heaven and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, the spirit of the God of the universe living in them to do, to accomplish this task that he's called them to accomplish, what did they do? They took this gospel message out um, into the nations and every single disciple except one died in a country that was not their own right? This should tell us something about the gospel. Like this should tell us something about the importance of doing whatever it takes while we're still here to make sure that every single person has the opportunity to hear about Jesus at least one time. Are y'all with me? Okay. If there was another way to do it, he would have told us. God has called us to be his hands and his feet and his voice. And he's asking us to do what he's been asking people to do from the very beginning of time. Uh, when God was talking to Moses, um, and you can read about this in Acts through Stephen's retelling or in Exodus, when he was talking to Moses about um, when, the, when the, oh my goodness, when the Israelites were still slaves in Egypt, he was talking to Moses, he said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them. And everybody's like, yeah, he's going to rescue them. He's going to rescue the Israelites. But the next words out of the Lord's mouth to Moses were, now go, I'll send you. So God is using the same strategy today to reach people. It's nothing new. That's a, I love that the Lord is so consistent because my life is so inconsistent. And so I'm so thankful that he is just so consistent in what he does. And he uses the same plans. He's not looking for new, prod, not new, new programs. He's, he's just a consistent God, and I am so thankful for that. Um, when I was younger, I read this verse in Luke 12. I was probably a teenager. You know that verse in Luke 12 that says, To whom much is given... Much is required, right? And that stood out to me then, but it stood even it stood out even more to me as an adult. To whom much is given, much is required. And I look around, and we've all been given so much. You know, we are some of the most blessed people in the world. We've got clothes on our backs, right? At some point within the last 24 hours, we've had food on our stomachs. You know, we have a church to go to. I drive through cities in Thailand that don't have a church. You know, there's multiple churches in Katy to go to. We're glad you chose this one. But there's so many churches that we have. We have um, every Bible translation and version from the King James all the way down to a children's Bible. 
you know? We have Christian podcasts. We have Christian radio stations. We have so many resources, books. Thailand does not have a Christian radio station. Thailand does not have Christian podcasts. And Thailand has very, very few Christian books. And the Bible that the Thai people use is like using the King James Version. You know how hard it is for a new believer to sit there and read the King James Version? So it's very difficult for Thai people to understand the Bible if they wanted to read it. But we have so much to whom much is given, much will be required. And when, when I was older, it was required of me to leave my job and move to Thailand. You know, that's what was required of me. And I loved my job. I was a pharmacy technician for like 10 years. And I, I had the opportunity to go to pharmacy school. I call it pharmacy school, but to school to be a pharmacist. And I felt like, what a great opportunity. The company that I worked for said they would be willing to pay for it as long as I signed a contract to work with them for like two years. And I was like, that's a sweet deal. But I just felt like that was not the right thing to do. You know, and I even prayed, and I was like, Lord, I feel like it's not the right thing to do. Are you sure it's not the right thing to do, Lord? Have you prayed about this, Lord? You know, I just, it was such a great opportunity, but that is what he was requiring of me, and I knew that I had to be obedient because I had this fear that if I was not obedient, then that when the day comes and I stand before the Lord, that scripture would like rise up and judge me, you know, and I didn't want that to happen. But that's what was required of me. You know, what's required of all of us is different. I don't know what the Lord requires of all of you. But all I know is that whatever we do, you know, wherever we go, we cannot forget these people. Because if we forget about them, there is no hope for them. Because we're the church. You know, we're the generation. We're the people that have to pray for them. You know, and yeah, you know, I don't know, maybe God's requiring you to sacrifice your time and to, in prayer, a little more time to pray for the people in these red countries, you know, to, or maybe he's requiring you to give some more money to help send people that are willing to go to these, you know, red zone countries, you know, I don't know, or maybe he's requiring you to go. If someone were to raise their hand today and say, I'll go with you, mom, put your hand down. I'm just teasing. <laughs> I'm just teasing. If you were to raise your hand today and say, I'll, I'll go with you, I'd be like, come on, let's go. Because we need people to go to these red countries. Like, we need people there. You know, so I don't know what God's requiring of you, but whatever he does, we cannot forget them because the world doesn't care about them. You know, the world doesn't care if they die and go to hell, but this is something that we should wrestle with, you know, and I... I want you to feel the weight of it because I feel the weight of it. But I, I shouldn't be the only one that feels the weight of it. I want you to feel the weight of it because I really believe that as believers, especially as American believers, the Lord has really blessed us. You know, and we have a big responsibility because we're not only responsible to reach our lost loved ones and our lost friends and coworkers and anyone who the Lord puts in our path, but we're also responsible to reach those, to reach them. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray real fast, and I'll turn it over to Pastor Rebecca. God, I thank you for your goodness to us. The fact that we are here in this room means that we've had the opportunity to struggle with this idea of the gospel, to count the cost, and to make a decision to follow you or not. And God, there are 40% of the people in this population today, or this planet today, 2,000 years after you told us to go, 2,000 years after Jesus gave his life, and today you're still asking us to give our lives for them. We have an opportunity to reach people. God, help us to remember them. Bring them to our memory. Help us to be willing to do whatever it takes to reach the ones who have yet to hear about you. And God, thank you so much for blessing our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we let Autumn know how much we've enjoyed her this morning? Thank you so much. Before you slip out, can you give us some specific prayer requests that we can join praying for you and your work there in Thailand? Then you mentioned about the having some, some Christian Thai yes, people. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I wish I remember what I told you before. So Buddhism, just real fast, Buddhism 
is so strong in Thailand, it's their identity. You know, it, it's who they are. It's, it's in everything they do. It's, in, it's, it's just who they are. And so um, they actually have a saying that says to be Thai is to be Buddhist, mm -hmm. which basically means if you're not Buddhist, you're no longer Thai. And so, you know, they think you lose your identity if you become a Christian. But there are Christian ties. I don't have any working with me, but I've been praying, or Rebecca and I have both been praying, that if we could just get one Christian to model what it looks like to be a Thai Christian, that could really help us reach more students. But because there's so few Christians, it's really hard to find some that are willing to come and work with us. So if you could be praying that we could find at least one Thai Christian, because I'm, a, I'm not, I don't have to be the hero, you know, I don't have to be the one that, you know, leads people to the Lord, but I, if we could just get one Thai Christian, you know, that would just be a game changer for us. Amen. How many are going to join in? Let's pray. Amen. The Lord can do it. He knows exactly where that person is, and they're waiting for you to get back. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you, family, for being here. What a treat to have you here, and I know you've been stirred in your heart. Uh, don't let this moment of the Holy Spirit speaking to you of what you can do. Uh, leave. Take it with you and, and, and be sensitive to that voice when you're doing laundry, washing dishes, picking up the kids. Say a prayer for those unreached people groups and then be sensitive to the, to the Lord's voice for you, what you can do. Hands on, practical, what you can do. God loves this world, doesn't he? And he sees each one. He knows each one. He knows them by name. And we are privileged as his children to be a part of that. And I'm so grateful we can partner with wonderful missionaries who have such a burden and a passion. I just enjoy so much listening. Just the passions just float. There's a love there. And we know that God has blessed you. He's going to continue to bless you. And... Um, it's going to be good, good, good reports. All right, let's stand, and we're going to close in prayer. Um, thank you again for being here today. We'll see you next week as we uh, continue to move forward in our uh, study of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at a little donkey next week, so you don't want to miss the donkey. Amen. And remember, after our Bible study next week, we'll be going to glorious. So mark that on your calendars. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we've had to gather together in this beautiful place to hear your servant share your heart with us today for the Thai people. Father, let us receive this same burden, Lord, to pray, to intercede. God, in this picture of the man drowning off the cruise ship, don't let it leave us as we think of those who have not heard, that just have not ever heard it. In the name of Jesus, we pray for those souls, Lord. We pray the power of the Holy Spirit to enlighten their minds to receive it. And Father, strengthen the hands of those that are going out to those people. Strengthen Autumn, we pray. Oh, thank you, Lord, for her passion, for her love, her commitment. Every day, a surrender and obedience to you. We thank you for it. We pray you would just continue to strengthen her, Lord, physically, emotionally, spiritually, Lord. Just, just step in close and breathe words of comfort and encouragement to her each day as they read your word that you're speaking to them, Lord, reminding them they're right where you want them to be. And Father, we pray specifically for this prayer that you would be able to send a Christian Thai worker to come in and help them, Lord. If this is what is needed, oh God, to give the breakthrough in this work, we ask that you would bring it in the name of Jesus. You can raise up a student they're working with right now in the name of Jesus. You're so creative. You can do all all kind of wonderful things, but we pray, oh Lord, for the breakthrough in the name of Jesus through that dome to be pierced by the power of the Holy Spirit, that your love, your message, your hope, oh God, can be brought to them. They can receive it in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Every seed that has been planted, we believe you by the power of the Holy Spirit to give fruit in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, we thank you. We we thank you, Jesus. You love this world. You gave
gave your own life for this world for us. Oh, help us not be selfish with this message we've received. Let us be bold, oh God, and strong to share it. Give us a burden and a passion for those in our lives, Jesus, what we can do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your wonderful kingdom and that we're a part of it and we get to work in it. Thank you, Jesus, and thank you for the strength that you give us. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and we give you glory. I pray a blessing on each lady here today. I pray protection. Father, as we travel, I pray that you would just continue to help us in our assignments. Oh, and we'll be so careful to give you praise and glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. And be sure and greet Autumn, greet her family. And we will see you guys next Tuesday.